Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It's the 23rd of August and decent number of updates this week. As always, you can jump to the update you care about the most. New videos this week, just one video, but it was a, a big one. SC900 Study Cram V2. With all of the new types of security services, I thought it was time to update the video. So it's about two hours and it's a cram designed to complement the Microsoft Learn where it goes into all of the details. On to what's new on the compute side. So VMSS flexible orchestration mode. Remember, this is the newer orchestration mode. It's different from the uniform mode we had before. With uniform, you had one configuration that then created, deleted the instances based on scaling rules you defined. With flexible, we can have mixes. We can have spot and non-spot, different SKUs, the VMs that get created wherever I leverage the profile are full VMs. I can still manage and interact with them. So now the attach detach is in preview. So what this enables me to do is, as the name suggests, I can add virtual machines into the VMSS flex set. I can detach them. Maybe I need to go and do some operation on that flex debug in some way. Maybe I even want to move it between different VMSS flex sets. And the benefit there when I go and move it into the VMSS Flex is then I can take advantage of the Flex capabilities, that orchestration of patches, of repairs, of OS upgrades, and all of those other capabilities. Now to use this, you do have to have the fault domain set to one. And when I set fault domain to one, it doesn't mean use one fault domain. It implies to use as many fault domains to spread the VMs across as many fault domains as can be done on a best efforts basis. And that is the default value. So now I can attach and detach VMs from my VMSS Flex scale set. Continuing that, we also now has VMSS Flex instance mix. Now what this enables me to do is in that profile I talked about, which is where I want it to go and create and delete those virtual machines, I can now specify a number of different VM sizes that I want it to select from. Today, it's up to five I can specify. And then I can also specify, well, how do I want it to allocate? Do I want it to allocate based on use the lowest priced option I can? Do I want to allocate based on, for example, capacity optimized? So now I can go and specify those different types of SKU and let it intelligently pick the type of size and SKU based on how I specify that. So that's gonna help me optimize the resources I use, which will in turn help me optimize my cost. And then API management workspaces has gone GA. Remember API management is that capability where as an organization, we probably have many different APIs that we leverage. So API management lets me centralize the, the documentation, which helps me then discover them from all the different developers we may have. It lets me actually make them available and expose them. So I can have all the APIs on the back end, then expose them via API management. To give a single entry point, I can rewrite elements of it as a developer portal. So it has a whole set of capabilities to manage, discover, and make available the APIs in my organization. What workspaces let me do, if think of it like with an API management, if I have folders where I could group uh, the different APIs, the products I group them into, the subscriptions, the logs, the resources, all authorized with Azure role-based access control, and also its own API gateway instance. So I'm giving a lot of isolation and control to particular sets of developers, but my core API platform team would still have full central monitoring, full enforcement of any API policies, uh, compliance, and then publishing of APIs of discovery through the developer portal. So it gives some autonomy to my developer groups while still having that centralized uh, API management team. So that is now GA. On the networking side, so Azure Sphere Locate Device feature has gone GA. Remember, Azure Sphere is the Microsoft Internet of Things all up big security solution. So now I can specify a device ID by the portal's locate device feature, and it will provide links to the device, the associated products the device is part of, device groups, etc. I'm sure I've mentioned this before, but Azure Front Door 
uh, web application firewall JavaScript challenge is in preview. So this is part of the bot manager rule set, and I can use it in custom rules as well. And it's invisible to the end user other than they would see a little box pop up for a couple of seconds saying we're checking you're not a bot. But what it's doing is this invisible web challenge to help it distinguish between legitimate users and bots. And so malicious bots would fail the challenge to help protect your web applications from those bots. So that is now in preview. On the storage side, so planned customer managed failover is in preview. Now this is for Azure storage. So for Azure storage, I can use geo redundant storage. So I have three copies of the data in the primary region and then three copies in that paired region. Now what we had before was unplanned failover. And what this would let me do is it would show me the last sort of update time because it's an asynchronous replication because there's lots of distance between it so it can't be synchronous. And then if I did that unplanned failover, well, it would fail over. I would lose whatever hadn't been committed and replicated yet. Then it would become LRS on the other side. So I'd have to go and set a bunch of stuff up to want to be able to fail back again. What this does is it actually has a planned failover to maintain the geo redundant nature. So think of it swapping the primary and secondary. So it switches the endpoints. And what it's also going to do is it's going to look at, well, where is the current state as part of that asynchronous replication? And it will work out what is the delta. It will then replicate those delta missing bits of data to that secondary region to ensure it is caught up. And then it will do the switch. So I maintain the GRS. I don't lose any data. So it's a much better experience. So this is now uh, in preview. Azure NetApp Files call access has gone GA. So if you think of Azure NetApp Files as that very premium storage solution for NFS and SMB, well, for data that I'm infrequently using, it can go and move it to Azure Storage, which is cheaper. And so I specify a coolness period, i.e. how long that data has been inactive. I think by default it's 31 days, but I can change that and it will go and move the data transparently to Azure Storage. And I can also set the retrieval behavior. So if a user actually tries to access it, they'll still see it through the same sort of ANF, but then it will go and, does it pull it back? Does it pull it back on certain operations or does it not pull it back at all? And the user obviously gets a, a slightly different experience because it's now on Azure Storage. Azure Databox Disk, self-encrypting disk has gone GA. So remember there's different capabilities for Azure Databox. Azure Databox Disks is, it's a disk that gets shipped to your location, you copy data to it and you ship it back. So for Windows based, it used BitLocker. Well, for Linux based, now it has self-encrypting disks, which is actually using hardware in the disk. So there's no requirement on the host for that encryption, which means, hey, on the Linux side, I now get a performance that is comparable with the Windows host that was using BitLocker. So this is for Europe, US, and Japan. And again, there's no software dependency. It's just encrypting within the disk. Azure Databox multi-tier support has gone GA. So once again, in the past, when I would set up my Azure Databox to do an import into Azure Storage, it would go to whatever the default tier is of the Azure Storage account. So hot, call whatever that default was. What this enables me to do is on the Azure data box, there'll actually be a folder structure that also now represents the different tiers. And so when I copy the data to the data box and I pick the associated folder for the tier, when it is brought into Azure storage, well, it will populate the correct tier, hot, cool, cold, etc. And also Azure Databox has now got some integration with Storage Mover. Obviously because Databox is a physical unit that ships to your data center, you copy data to it and then it gets shipped over and then it gets read back in. Well, there's that shipping time and there's the time to import the data. So a delta arises between the source system and that target storage account. What Azure Storage Mover will do is it will work out what is the delta and bring that storage account up to date so it gets them in sync. 
Miscellaneous. So there were some cost management updates. If we go and just quickly look. Big one here is as part of the FinOps initiatives, the Focus 1.0, it now supports exporting in Parquet format. It does different types of compression. Obviously, Parquet is very popular in many data lakes. And Microsoft Fabric uses Parquet and it updated its engines to talk for Parquet. Um, we have the compression type. It even then mentions, hey, we can bring this into Microsoft Fabric. There are some pricing update experiences for a number of the different capabilities as well. So we have all of that. Then there are a bunch of retirements. Um, the app service environment V1, V2 expires end of August. So hopefully you're on the V3 by now. Also API management STV1 compute platform, again, retires as does the Logic Apps uh, integration service environment. All of those worked off of the older cloud service that also retires end of August. And a new one, so Azure Automation State Configuration retires 16th of September, 2027. So you probably don't have to rush on that one. And that was it. As always, I hope that was useful. Till next video, take care.